On the 8th of September 2001, Tony Fernandez and Cameroodan Merinon signed an agreement to purchase an obscure airline called AirAsia for the grand total of one ringgit. Three days later, 9-11 would happen, putting the aviation industry in a tailspin. The price of oil was skyrocketing and passenger confidence was shaken. But AirAsia not only survived this turmoil, but would use it as a launching pad to become the largest low-cost airline in Asia and the fourth largest overall airline. This is the story of AirAsia. Tony Fernandez, then just a boy at boarding school in London, remembers the day his mother passed away as one of the darkest days of his life. And still, to this day, he cannot wrap his mind around the fact that he was not able to be with her before she passed due to the exorbitant price of air travel at the time. He vowed back then that one day he would make flying affordable. I'll leave the Tony Fernandez biography video for another day, but the speedrun version is this. Born in KL to a mother from Malacca who sold Tupperware, good enough to sell sand at the beach apparently, Tony's father was from Goa and was an engineer before switching to an architect before finally settling as a doctor working for the WHO. Tony went to boarding school in England, studied accounting at university in London, he then entered the workforce and eventually at the age of 28 took over as the CEO of Warner Malaysia. He left Warner in early 2001 because the industry refused to innovate but also because he was starting to lose interest and this is where the story of AirAsia starts. One afternoon in February 2001, Tony was at the Spaniards Inn in London when he saw Stelios, the founder of EasyJet, being interviewed on TV. Tony was intrigued and he remembers at the time that there were no low-cost airlines that he knew of operating in Asia. So out of curiosity and excitement, he raced to Luton Airport and was blown away. It felt like the entire airport was EasyJet branded. Orange was everywhere. Passengers were flying off to Barcelona for £8 and Paris for £6. From the blanket branding of the airport to the simplicity of their product offering, it was a sight to behold. And at that moment, Tony Fernandez decided he was going to start an airline. But how do you start a business if you know nothing about the industry? The answer was to do something Tony excelled at, talking to people. He was able to speak with Sir Brian Walpole, one of British Airways' most well-known pilots and had been the Queen's Concorde pilot. Clive Beddo, one of the founding stakeholders of a low-cost carrier called WestJet based in Canada, and his old mate Mark Weston, who was a lawyer involved in aircraft leasing. Mark then suggested he speak to GECAS, the aviation leasing arm of GE, and one of the biggest in the industry at the time, with a fleet of nearly 2,000 planes leased out to airlines in 76 different countries. But before anything else, they needed an airline license. And getting one required political connections, for which they had none. So they approached Pahamin Abrajab, who was the Secretary General of the Ministry at the time, and they asked if he could be their chairman for their still unnamed airline venture. Pahamin managed to arrange a meeting with Prime Minister Mahathir bin Mohammed in July 2001, their only chance to get this airline off the ground. Mahathir was receptive to the idea of a new low-cost airline, but with a caveat. You've got to buy an airline. I won't give you a license to create a new one, because I've had too many failed airlines. So that basically meant, get in loser, we're going shopping. The search for an airline began. They approached an airline called Palangi Air, but they came back with, give us $40 million and we'll turn the airline around for you. Tony remembers, we looked at the books and it was a joke. Only God could have turned that company around. We politely declined. Fast forward a few weeks, and with no further progress on the airline shopping, Tony was playing a game of golf and saw the corporate communications director for DRB Highcom, one of Malaysia's leading manufacturers. Tony knew they owned a tiny airline called AirAsia, but knew nothing else about the airline. Because AirAsia at that time was so insignificant that even as desperate as they were, it hadn't appeared on their list of potential airlines to buy. Still, Tony went up to him, and their conversation was brief, but went like this. Hey, I hear you have an airline. Yeah, wanna buy it? You can have it tomorrow. We don't need it. So Tony went home that night and frantically tried to learn more about this little airline called AirAsia. So what did AirAsia look like at that time? It had a few domestic routes, a couple of 737-300s, and about 200 staff. It had been set up in the mid-90s by Tansri Yahya Ahmed, the founder of DRB Highcom, with the aim of becoming the second largest carrier in Malaysia after Malaysian Airlines. Tragically, Ahmed died in 1997 in a helicopter crash and AirAsia had been nothing but a burden on DRB's books ever since. 
By 2001, it had accumulated 40 million ringgit in debt, and Tony and Din went to see the deputy CEO of DRB the next day, who was keen to rid his company of the airline. You can have the airline tomorrow. How much do you want to pay for it? Tongue in cheek, Tony replied, one ringgit. And the response? You can have the airline for one ringgit, provided you remove our corporate guarantee from GECAS. So let's break that down. Firstly, remember GECAS is GE Capital Aviation Services, the aviation leasing arm of GE. And a corporate guarantee is an instrument that is provided by a parent company when one of its smaller subsidiaries enters in a long-term agreement with a third party. So in this case, DRB Highcom guaranteed payment of the leases for the aircraft as long as the lease was in place. But obviously, DRB Highcom wanted to sell the company but didn't want to continue to provide the guarantee. So Tony and Din needed to get GECAS's approval for the acquisition because they needed the guarantee that the leases for the two planes that AirAsia operated would be paid. GECAS had entered into the leases for the planes because DRB Highcom owned the airline. Would they be sympathetic to the young industry upstarts and their business plan? Fortunately, they were able to remove the guarantee so they could go ahead and buy AirAsia for one ringgit. The paperwork was signed on the 9th of September 2001, subject to due diligence. Only two days later, 9-11 would occur. The aftermath, turning the aviation industry on its head. After the initial shock of 9-11 subsided, Din rang Tony and asked, should we still do this? And he was justified for asking. The short-term economics were horrible in every conceivable way. The price of oil was going through the roof, and passenger confidence was absolutely plummeting. To most people, starting an airline at this moment in history seemed like the stupidest idea ever. But Tony knew they had to do it. We've got to make sure people can fly. Just four days after 9-11, there was some positive news for AirAsia. Originally, they were planning to swap their two existing 737-300s for the smaller and older 737-200 model because the 300s were too expensive to run. But Geekass approached AirAsia with a proposal. Because the lease rates collapsed because of 9-11, they offered AirAsia to keep the 737-300s, but they would halve the rate. This change benefited them big time. Projected revenues went up because the 300s carried about 20 extra seats and the costs were reduced because the 300s were more efficient and powerful, meaning fuel costs and flight times were reduced. So what did AirAsia now have? It had a license, two aeroplanes, some staff, and they'd even inherited some routes. What didn't AirAsia have? Money. Din and Tony were trying to remortgage their houses to have something to put in as they forecasted that they'd need 20 million ringgit to get the business running. In the end, they agreed that they'd just have to run it on the cash that they took in. If they wanted to operate a low-cost airline, they'd have to practice what they preached and survive hand to mouth. Finally, on the 8th of December 2001, once the due diligence had been completed, Tony and the board finally signed for and took over the airline. But they couldn't implement their low-cost model immediately because the remnants of the old airline remained. They relied on existing routes and the structures for the first few weeks until they could convert their planes and introduce the full low-cost plan. The low-cost model included a number of different aspects, including frequent short or mid-haul flights so they could operate a larger volume of flights per day, optimally utilising their fleets and increasing passenger traffic, a point-to-point -point transit model so low-cost carriers fly from point A to point B with no connecting stops in between. Unlike the traditional hub and spoke model, where two or more cities are connected via a hub airport, point to point allows low cost carriers to have shorter travel times and connect cities directly with a lower dependence on airports. Operations at smaller or cheaper airports? These so called secondary airports are less congested and offer more available slots and faster taxiing times. This not only helps low cost carriers maintain their large volume of flights, but also increases their negotiating powers with the airport. Single service class? No business on low cost. Unbundled ancillaries, selling cheap tickets doesn't generate much revenue for the carriers. And these base fare earnings are heavily taxed. So to generate more revenue, low cost carriers charge an extra fee for any additional services provided. And the last one, direct sales. So they skip the middleman and the fees associated with things like travel agents and partners. Some people joke that we're just lucky the low cost airlines don't charge us for emotional baggage too. But over the course of the next six months, AirAsia converted their planes to increase the number of seats in the cabin from 124 to 148 by ripping out business class completely. Once converted, their fares are aggressively low. The normal fare to Kota Kinabalu was 400 Malaysian ringgit, but they were offering seats for 150. Through 2002, 
AeroAsia added three more planes and within seven months had wiped out their 40 million ringgit in debt. But in the early days, even something as simple as adding flight destinations was tougher than woodpecker lips. It took them seven years to be able to fly direct to Singapore. So Tony decided on a workaround. They would fly to Johor in southern Malaysia, about a 40 minute bus ride from Singapore, and then take their passengers over the border by bus. They launched the route, and on the very first day, once the passengers reached the Singapore border, the bus was impounded and the passengers dumped. They couldn't get them in. That was the level of opposition they faced initially. However, AirAsia would eventually hit some heavy financial turbulence. In 2008, when the financial crisis hit Wall Street and the global markets, AirAsia was badly exposed by hedged investments they'd made on the oil price. Prior to the financial crash, the price of oil was going through the roof and killing the airline's bottom line. So AirAsia took hedged positions to try and control their exposure. When the global crisis hit, the price plummeted and it wiped out all of their cash. They were down to their last 5 to 10 million ringgit, which wasn't far off where they started in 2001. A renewed intense focus on cost, aggressive marketing, and the discipline to get back to their frugal early days behavior meant that within two years, they were back to having 1 billion ringgit in cash. But the lesson was learned. Avoid the derivatives game, and if hedging, it is only for a year, and fix all interest rates and exchange rates where possible. So by 2012, AirAsia was a real force in ASEAN aviation. They had a fleet of 118 planes and had carried nearly 20 million passengers since inception. Their pace of growth left a lot of competitors in their wake and the more established airlines were starting to worry. And because of this, an opportunity arose. In 2012, the CEO of Malaysia Airlines, Idris Jalla, had been to see Nazir Azak, the chairman of CIMB Group, which was one of the largest financial services providers in Malaysia and ASEAN, and he suggested that Malaysia Airlines and AirAsia explore the possibility of a merger. Malaysia Airlines was struggling at the time and had been for a number of years. They had also been asking the Prime Minister for a refinancing package to secure the airline's future. But Tony was excited for the possibility of a merger. It was a sign of how far they had come that the national carrier would want to join forces with them. And on paper, the merger made sense. Blending Malaysia Airlines' fleet, destination and economies of scale with AirAsia's innovation and execution. But the political pressure groups and unions were strongly against the proposed merger. And in the end, Prime Minister Mahathir said that the deal was economically sound but a political minefield. So the government decided to shelve the potential merger. For AirAsia, it was an opportunity that didn't quite work out. But for Malaysia Airlines, the fallout was more than that. After the deal fell apart, they had to go through a massive restructuring which led to thousands of job losses. Tony mentioned it was a little frustrating seeing the deal get shelved, but as far as AirAsia was concerned, it was still a milestone. The national full-service carrier would have merged with them had the political climate been right, but the key takeaway was AirAsia was on the right track. AirAsia has continued to go from strength to strength. As of December 2019, AirAsia had 275 aircraft across 8 airlines. They flew to 159 destinations across 23 markets, They had flown 100 million passengers annually across 11,000 flights per week. Tony in his autobiography said that after 16 years, his business philosophy can be summed up in three points. A company must be able to adapt to change, a company must be disruptive, and a company must have the right people. But what about the future of AirAsia? The future is now about moving AirAsia from just an airline to a big data technology company, because that's where I see the next frontier. Data is the new oil, and I want AirAsia not only to be the world's best low-cost airline every year in the future, I want it to be a data platform to drive other businesses. What airlines haven't realized, and obviously some are trying to emulate us now, um, is that their biggest asset is data. In AirAsia's case, our biggest asset is data plus our brand. I mean, you know, everyone knows AirAsia. It is quite remarkable how a little company in Malaysia has has, has created this, this kind of phenomena. But let's not beat around the bush. COVID has been a spanner in the works for AirAsia to say the least, but the same can be said for all passenger airlines. AirAsia is still the largest low-cost airline in Asia and the fourth largest overall in the region. Not bad for a company worth one ringgit just 20 odd years ago. If you enjoyed my deep dive on AirAsia, make sure to feed the YouTube algorithm and interact with the video, whether it's a like, a comment or a subscription. But until next time, have a good one.